Amen. So, you know, most of the time when I talk about, someone talks about worship with me, they mean singing in church. But I want to talk about more than songs. I want to talk about worship, but more than songs. Romans 12.1 says, So, my dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. That's the first mutual. We're going to see mutuals today because of all he's done for you. He said, this is um, a, uh, he says, let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind that he will find acceptable. Um, and this is truly the way to worship him, he said. And he says, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. And then you will learn to know God's will for you, and it's going to be good and pleasing and perfect. You'll like it after a while. <laughs> Just like the words you guys got and the words I've got. Um, true, so true worship is a totally surrendered life doing God's will inside and outside the church. That's true worship. Uh, true worship isn't confined into the church. It's everywhere. Uh, Hebrews 10, 5, it says, When Christ came into the world, he said to God, You do not want animal sacrifices or sin offerings, but you gave me a body to offer. You're not pleased with burnt offerings and with offerings for sins. Then I said, look, I have come to do your will, O God, just as has been uh, um, written about me in the scriptures. That's from Christ. And Christ was, uh, when, when, on the night when he was betrayed, after the communion, in the garden, in Matthew 26 and 39, he prayed, Lord, if it's possible, my Father, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. That statement is the definition of giving your body to God, which he literally did. But there's a living sacrifice. You give your body to God and you go on living. Christ, Christ was a living sacrifice every single day of his life till he was a dead sacrifice. He was always a sacrifice. And, and it's interesting that um, our relationship with God is mutual, right? It's God, we love each other. And here you see God sacrificing for us. The God who asked us to sacrifice for him is sacrificing for us. Jesus is sacrificing for us. So it's mutual. We love each other so much, we're willing to sacrifice for each other. God's given us the opportunity to love him that much, to sacrifice for him. In Acts 20, 24, I'm still on, on what does it mean to give your bodies to Christ? Give your bodies to God. He says, Paul says, my life's worth nothing to me unless I use it to finish the assignment that I received from the Lord Jesus Christ. Otherwise, my life, it doesn't even, it's meaningless to me. I don't even, you know, care about it. It's a total surrender. He says, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. That's, again. Right. And then he's, it's not just total surrender. It isn't just for the special Christian seals, you know, the special ops, um, you know, the highly trained. Uh, it says, I plead, it, it says um, in, the, in Romans 12, 1, it starts out, dear brothers and sisters, that that appeal to give your bodies to God is for everyone. And Paul wrote in Colossians 3.17 to everyone, whatever you do or say, whatever you do or say, inside, outside of church, whatever your job is, whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus Christ. And there's no word in the scriptures that's given without the Holy Spirit saying, you do it, I will do it. If you say yes, I will empower you. You will be like that. It's like a prophecy over you. And it's a prophecy over me. The prophecy is if you want you can represent me in whatever you do or say. It's like, wow, <laughs> that's a great one. Galatians 5.25, he says, since we're living by the Spirit, let's follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our life. There again, living sacrifice, giving our bodies to God, total surrender, every part of our life. In John 4.23, Jesus says, true worshipers will worship God in spirit and truth. And those are the um, kind of worshipers that God is looking for, the Father is looking for. A spirit, worshiping um, in, the, in, in spirit means obviously sincerely from your heart, right? But if you're talking about giving your bodies to God, it's also by the power of the Holy Spirit. So when we worship in spirit, it's by the power of the Holy Spirit, and it's from our heart. It's, it's sincere. Worshiping in truth comes from our mind. It's believing what God said about himself in the Bible. Um, as opposed to making up our own ideas of God and our own standards. Because the Bible says that Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. He likes to use religion. 
And um, in fact, in, when Moses was coming into the promised land in Deuteronomy 12, he told Israel, you must not worship the Lord the way these other nations um, worship their gods. He says, um, for they perform for their gods um, every detestable act that the Lord hates. So in their very religion, trying to supposedly pleasing God, God's saying what they're doing is detestable to me. I hate it. Um, you know, when you look at, at Paul, he said in his day, people were offering food sacrifices to the idols. Paul said they're actually sacrificing to demons. It's demonic what they're doing. And so even today, all world religions reject the Bible and what the Bible says about God, about Jesus, about God's standards, and they teach people um, to please God or whatever their idea of God is by self-righteousness. Now, I grew up uh, being taken to church by my mom. Thank you, mom. Um, it took me a while to be able to say thank you, mom, but I, I grew up being taken to church. And if someone had been able to install a worship cage on me from zero to ten, I don't think I ever moved the needle. <laughs> you know, I just was going through. We, we, you know, I sang a lot of hymns without, you know, without, without any, any meaning to it all to me. Um, and so I actually planned to quit going to church as soon as I graduated from high school. However, before I could do that, um, God encountered me during my junior year of high school in front of my house. And he encountered me with the words right in my head, you need to become a Christian right now. No wonder I didn't worship. <laughs> I wasn't even saved. You need to become a Christian right now. Now, when I was born again, I became a different person. Now, before that, I was enthusiastic about a lot of things, you know, Dodgers, Lakers, you know, sports, surfing, motorcycles, the girl across the street, you know, all, all kinds of stuff that I was enthusiastic about. The Lord just wasn't among them. I had zero enthusiasm for the Lord. Once I got born again, I started reading the Bible, and, and I started reading in Matthew. Long before I got to Matthew 22, the Lord had already written it in my heart. Matthew 22, 37, it says, you must lo love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind. And all I can tell you, it was like being in a, in a funny car where they go from zero to oh, in your, you know, your stretch vehicle like this. <laughs> By the end of the month, I loved the Lord. I was full of enthusiasm to want to do his will and, and um, live with him and for him. Now, um, in 2 Corinthians 3.18, uh, we are told, all of us who have had the veil removed, that means when you're born again. It's like, for me, a veil was removed. The first veil was when he, when he, he told me there's no guarantee. I said later, he says, there's no guarantee, I'll ask you later. I, I had a veil removed where I saw eternity in hell, in heaven, real clear. And it put fear on me, and that's why I got saved, actually. Um, but the second veil, when I got born again, that second veil is, is, changes our heart and our mind. And it says all of us who've had the veil removed can see and reflect the Lord. And the Lord, who's a spirit, makes us more and more like him as we're changed into his glorious image. And so God doesn't do worship to build up his fragile ego. I really need these people. You know, I'm feeling discouraged. You know, worship has zero to do with ego. Worship is actually an invitation to relationship. Amen. God says, I, w I would like you to get to know me. In fact, I want you to get closer to me so we can be friends and we can be in unity. We can live in unity with each other. Um, that's what worship is about. And so the more we know God, who is so infinitely beyond our understanding and our, even our imagination, when we start to know this God, the more we're going to start worshiping. And the more we worship, the more we start becoming like God. And it says in Romans 2, 7, that as a result of that, God is going to give us much glory and honor and immortality. He even tells us to seek. God appreciates people who seek his glory and honor and immortality. And so here's our mutual relationship. We love each other, we sacrifice each other, and we praise each other. God, we worship God. He praises us right back. He loves praising us. It's like a culture of honor. So anyway, I stayed in church, even though I wasn't connecting with the music, with, with the hymns. Um, I, was, I was now born again, but I just wasn't connecting. I didn't get the messages. I wasn't connecting with that. And I also wasn't connecting with any relationships with people. So that kind of limits what you're getting out of church. I, I would go home from church 
and I would turn on Calvary Chapel and sense the presence of God uh, across the TV. Well, um, you know, I stayed in church because I knew that that's what God wanted me to do now. And the problem I had was John 17, 22, when Jesus prayed for us, he says, I have given, you the given them the glory you gave to me. May they be one just as you and I are one. So there's some glory that comes to us some, from spiritual growth that makes us, puts us in relationships, spiritual friendships and relationships. I didn't have that. I was a complete isolated believer for the first two years of my, my faith. I had no spiritual friends or mentors, not one. And um, as a result, I landed in the wrong college and felt so lost in life. But here's, here's what the, the, the Lord says. He says um, about churches, Christ makes the whole body fit together perfectly. And as each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow. So the whole body's healthy and growing and full of love. And that would include me. But I wasn't working in the body. I wasn't relating in the body. So I wasn't growing in the body. I don't even know if I was growing. That, that first month, it was like funny car time. You know, I was really going. But after that, it's kind of like I'm, I'm just going on momentum now. Um, and I, I, my faith was genuine, but I don't. If I was growing at all, it was unnoticeable. And that's what landed me in the wrong college. And then the Lord told me to go to Biola Christian College. He, he, he spoke that in my mind. And then a few months later, he t I had this strong desire to serve somewhere in church. I didn't even know where or how, but just somewhere. And so I started learning the Bible every day at Biola, which was powerful. Can you imagine getting taught like five, six hours a day every day? So I'm learning a lot of Bible. And, and, um, and then in church, I am serving the, in the children's ministry, and I am growing big time in love and joy, and my spiritual gifts are getting activated. So for two years, there's hardly nothing. Three years later, um, my, my growth just started taking off because of that. It just went like a... Three years later, the youth pastor gives me a, a Christmas book, and I, I, I read in it, and he says, your growth has challenged us all. I never even thought about it. But it's true. Um, our spiritual growth can be a shock to people, a surprise to people. And their growth, you know, you guys are kind of behind the scenes type people, but that's the kind of growth I'm talking about. It's really pretty amazing. And we all can do that and encourage each other with our growth. So um, we had these weekly, and I'm going to talk about just how the Lord um, kept increasing me into worship. Um, Joy likes to call him Jehovah Sneaky. You know, he, he has ways of, of working in us we don't even know he's doing. So I'm in, I go to the Biola Chapel services, and, and I'm a head intellectual type Christian. Uh, the songs are like, let's get done with these songs and get to the meat, the messages. So I pretty much ignore the songs. Uh, about a year, uh, after a year in the school, out of the blue, I'm st standing there, and all of a sudden they're playing a song. I go, I want to sing for the Lord. Just, I don't know where it came from, and it never went away. In fact, I learned enough guitar so I could help lead the high school youth group in singing for the Lord in, in, in worship. And so it just came from the Holy Spirit just inside of me, and, and I just loved. All of a sudden, I loved. When I sang for the Lord, I just felt the presence of God on me. I, I love doing it to this, to this day. Um, now, about after I graduated from, now this is after I graduated so it's probably about five years later. Now I'm out, and I'm, I'm just taking you little snapshots of worship. So now I'm out in the park, and I'm praying at night. And I used to pray this pattern I learned at Biola called Acts. I don't know if any of you have heard of it. Um, the A is for adore God, where you, you praise him. C is for confess your sins. Um, T is for thanksgiving. And S is for supplication, where you ask for whatever you want. So typically, you know, I'd get to the T, and I'm off the T in about 30 seconds to a minute, you know, just fly by the T, you know, getting to wherever the S or wherever I was going. Well, this particular night, I get to the T, and I can't get off of it. I mean, the Holy Spirit falls on me so strong that as I'm thinking, I'm just feeling so much joy and delight and so much presence of God, I don't want to stop doing this. And I just kept thanking for most of my prayer time. I don't remember how long that lasted. I know it lasted maybe the, the, the week. To this day, I love thanking God. But, I mean, that intense intensity, um, I, I, it got where I wanted to thank God so bad. It's like, man, I've used everything up. I've got to think of something to be thankful for. You know, the smallest, oh, there's the smallest thing. Oh, yeah, yeah, just to keep the coal going in my fire, you know, keep that Thanksgiving going. 
And, and during one of those nights, it got interrupted with a, the Lord spoke to me. It was so clear. It wasn't an audible voice, but it was so clear. It shocked me. I'm like, and I, and I had heard the Lord before in my mind, but it shocked me. And I realized later that was a breakthrough. That's the thing about worship and seeking the Lord. There are breakthroughs in the midst of it. That was a breakthrough I had. After, from that day on, if I had a question, I, like even to this day, if I have a question, I'll go out and pray. I expect I'm going to get an answer. Not maybe. I expect I'm going to get one. You know, I'll hear something. And that started um, that night. So, so now a couple years later has gone by, and a lot has happened. Like I married Marty, you know, so <laughs> things are going good, you know. And we're now in Africa. And uh, I guess I, I don't know if I was still using the prayer pattern or not, but I think I might have been doing ACTS still. And so this time, I start with an A, which usually took me a minute or two. This time, I can't get off the A. I get stuck on the A, just like last time, adoring God. And, and it's like for a month, maybe two months, it seemed like every day the Spirit would give me a personality trait of God. And I would start looking at, looking at it, thinking about it, meditating on it, and I'd go, man, this is awesome. I would just be admiring God's personality. Wow, this is great. And just getting so much joy and delight out of it. It was comparable to me, like if I, I, I like to go to the beach, you know, and um, I, I used to go there right before school, you know, summer's almost over, and just look at the sunset into the water. I still like doing that. You know, it's, oh, man, this is good. Just That's the way it was with God. And I'm, I'm doing this um, day after day, just enjoying it, taking a lot of time. And in the, in the uh, middle of that, it was Christmas. Somebody sends us a Christmas tape from Amy Grant, um, and uh, probably from Marty. I don't know, but I got a hold of it, and I put this thing in. I think uh, I put this thing in the car. I mean, it's like turn the gas up on my worship. I'm, I'm worshiping to Christmas songs and just appreciating what I see in Jesus and in God so much. It's just consuming. It was one of the great Christmases I had, and I didn't have hardly any presents or trees or lights or candy or anything. Just that worship was just so much joy. Well, um, during that time, we got breakthroughs. We were getting breakthroughs in spiritual gifts during that time, and um, we had breakthroughs in, in gifts of of healing and deliverance and prophecy. And I had my first experience with the gift of tongues at that time, which was actually inspired by me saying, man, I'm going to run out of things to praise God for. I can't think of any more personality traits. I wish I could praise him in tongues. Then I would never run out. And sure enough, <laughs> that's another story. Psalm 104 invites all of us, enter his gates with thanksgiving. Come to his courts with praise. You want to get in God's presence? Start thanking God for everything. Start praising him. It's, and just let that fill your mind. And we, get, we all get in God's presence. We'll come into God's presence and power and more than you can imagine. That's, getting into God's presence constantly is a life. It's like going down a rabbit hole. You, you don't know where you're going to end up. Now, um, it says in 1 Thessalonians 5.18, be thankful in all circumstances. And it says in um, Psalm 34.1, praise the Lord at all times. So what I'm saying is that that to a totally surrendered life, when what they are saying and doing is worship, they live in that presence of God. They live in presence and power and breakthrough all the time. They're always praising the God, if not with their words, with their lives, with their deeds. They're always thankful. Um, it's powerful, and it's for us all. And so when we came back to the United States, we joined a church to learn how to use spiritual gifts of healing and deliverance and prophecy, but we unexpectedly experienced the, um, God's presence in a new and powerful way in small groups, churches, and conferences that I had never experienced before. You know, there, there's a Psalm um, 22, 3, it says about the Lord, yet you are holy and you're enthroned on the praises of Israel. Some versions say you inhabit the praises of Israel. So in these groups, they would be singing to God. You know, I was used to just kind of singing out into the atmosphere, singing out into the ether, and I was having a good time, but they were singing to God. It was like a musical prayer, and God would answer back, and, and it, was, it was the presence of God. Would, would, it would make the, the group alive with spiritual gifts and with its fruit of the Spirit, with love and joy and peace would come, you, you know, just palpable almost. 
um, healing, deliverance, um, prophecies would come quite often, and then powerful prayers would come out of that. Um, it reminds me of Le- Leviticus 26, 8, where it says, five of you will chase 100. 100 of you will chase 10,000. Not 20 times 100, but 10,000. It's exponential. And you'll notice in the book of Acts, God's revival came on individuals, but then the Spirit quickly gathered them together corporately into a church, and it went off exponential power. It went off exponentially. Um, the kind of church that they had, it's like in a corporate gathering, heaven starts touching the earth. Now, we all carry that as individuals. We should all carry that. But when you have unity like that, there's a special power in it that God wants. And when you can do that in a church, and it's true unity with God and the people, or a conference, heaven touches earth. And that's why when you read about these revivals, it's like, it is like reading about heaven on earth. And so... Um, I'm really excited about the conferences, any conference we have, or any church service, or any small group. I'm excited about them all. (laughs) But we happen to have a conference coming up. And I just hope that all of us will will appreciate that and um, come with great expectations of being in God's presence and power and breakthrough for yourself and and for the church. Now, in in Acts 1-9, Jesus said, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You'll be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere. Now, um, everywhere, I think, includes everywhere. It's yes, probably what the Greek means. That when the apostles were threatened with violence because they were preaching the word everywhere, they were threatened with violence, they went back to the church. And they said, we need to have a meeting. They had a prayer meeting at the church, Acts 4, 29 and 31, where you read, it says, they prayed, oh, Lord, hear their threats and grant us, your servants, great boldness in preaching your word. Stretch out your hand with healing power. May miraculous signs and wonders be done in the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Answer that. And it says the place where they were meeting shook. And they were filled with the Spirit, all of them filled with the Spirit. And they, they spoke the word of God with great boldness. And, and so boldness means um, unreserved freedom, unreserved um, freedom of godly speech and action. So in other words, if you have boldness, you are really out there. You're yourself. Now, hopefully you're a godly person, and so you control your own self. You don't say anything that comes to your head. But you are not afraid to be yourself out there and to represent the Lord. Um, instead uh, um, Instead of being intimidated... Um, The Holy Spirit wants to give us great boldness like that. So he doesn't want us to feel intimidated. He wants us to feel bold and free to be ourselves everywhere we go. And the Holy Spirit wants to use us to shake, shake, shake the church and the world. He wants us to shake them. Now, um, I don't, myself, I don't want to be so enthusiastic about a sporting game or a concert and so reserved in church about Jesus. I don't want to do it. Now, it's hard if you have a reserved atmosphere to be jumping and hopping around. I understand the church is somber, but you get the feeling. I would like a church where we are not always reserved. Um, In Samuel 6, 2 Samuel 6, it says King David decided to move the Ark of the Covenant from outside the city through the city streets to the temple. And when you read it, it's like some kind of combination. This procession is a combination of part parade, part fire tunnel, and part conga line. And the people were dancing in the streets. And King David said, hey, man, these kingly robes, are, they're, they're blocking my style. You know, he took off his kingly robes, and it says he's leaping and dancing. Well, his li- wife sees him go leaping by, and it says she was filled with contempt and disgust. He's making a fool out of himself. He's a king. He's making a fool out of himself. And um, probably other people thought that, too. Um, but only the wife would say it to his face, you know. Nobody else is going to tell the king he acted like a fool. But his wife did. And um, she mocked him. And, and David said, um, when she mocked him, David said, yes, and I'm willing to look like even more than a fool <laughs> in the future, you know, to worship the Lord. And it says, you know, so there's somebody else watching David too. It was the father. God was watching David. And he called David a man. He goes, that's a man after my own heart. You know, um, when we think of who God is and what he's done in our life, that's the basis of worship. When you think of who God is and what he's done in your life and what he's done in life, 
I think it would be good if we all remembered that it made David dance. You know, um, I thank God that thanks to some of you in here, JPL dances. We have dancing in here. It's like, oh, praise the Lord. I have a vicarious dancer. You're here by my dancer. You know, go for it. <laughs> it's a wonderful thing. You know, I took a personality test in Christian college, and I came out extremely, um, what was the word? Uh, extremely, um, oh, what is it? I'll get it in just a minute. Inhibited. Extremely inhibited. That's the opposite of boldness. <laughs> if you're inhibited, you're like self-conscious. Ooh, I hope I don't, forgive me for taking up space, you know, in the world. You're always worried about what other people, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to raise my hands. What will they think about me? It's the opposite. And so I'm a Christian. Something's got to give. Because the Holy Spirit says, God says, I've not given you a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and self-control. Something has to give. So for my whole life, I felt this blow in the back of my Move, okay, the whole time. But I tell you, I feel, maybe it's just because I'm getting older. I don't know. I don't care. But I'm getting bolder and bolder and bolder. <laughs> hey, may all of us grow boldness.